Hi, I'm Ashley Ford, coming up on 112BK. I know not every friend of mine is going to get to talk to Spike Lee, right. talk to Barack Obama, right. write about Colin Kaepernick. I'm writing about my, my own anxieties while dealing with someone else talking about their anxieties. Welcome to the show. In a moment, we're going to be talking with Brooklyn-based writer Rembert Brown about his recent profile of Spike Lee that was on the cover of Time. But first, we've got a call with Michael Musto. Speaking of writers, a legendary voice at The Village Voice, where he was a columnist for nearly 30 years, pinning La Dolce Musto, which provided a rich weekly window into the city's nightlife. The Voice, of course, announced last week that it's closing up its editorial shop. And we wanted to hear from one of the paper's former mainstays about what we've lost. Michael, are you there? Yes, hello. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Michael. My pleasure. So, The Village Voice was just described in the Times as a swaggering confidence and pizzazz, instantly responsive to zigs and zags of the downtown zeitgeist. How do you feel about New York City losing its voice? That's a very good description, and we were unselfconscious. We were fearless. It was a paper made for writers, and each writer mm -hmm. had his or her own beat and pursued it to the max. I was given my column in 1984, La Dolce Musto, and it was supposed to be an entertainment and nightlife column, and I did follow all of that religiously. I went out to three or four clubs a night, went to movie premieres, theater openings, and uh, after parties, and wrote it all up in this kind of breathless, diary-like first-person swirl every week. Mm -hmm. And I became more politicized as time went on and as the AIDS movement was growing, act up, activism was mounting. And so I became much more uh, politically charged in my column. Mm -hmm. And it really was a paper where we had the freedom to do whatever we wanted. Nobody told me, don't become political. Nobody said, don't be openly gay. Nobody said, don't write about this person or that person. They're too powerful. We had the total freedom to just run with the ball. Wow the space to be able to do something like that. It just, it seems like the city is really losing something with its closure. Um, but, you know, there are some folks who would say the voice has not been exactly the voice for a while. Would you say the same? Well, the problem is what the voice represented, which was the underground downtown culture and a very liberal political point of view, is much more prevalent now in the culture. Mm -hmm. When the voice started in the 50s and even in the 80s, when I started my column there, you know, there was no cable TV, there was no internet, there, was no, there were no social networks. It's everywhere now. The, you know, there, there's a TV show about drag queens. There's, right. You know what I mean? There's liberal 24-hour cable channels. So the voice became less special and I think became a little uncertain about its identity. What was the point of the voice? You know, to give service pieces on the 10 best cheeseburgers in the Bronx or right. to write against Trump or all of the above. I thought it could last as a website only because last year is when the owner, Pete Barbie, got rid of the print version, made it web only. I thought it could still serve a good purpose, but uh, I guess it was inevitable that eventually it was going to peter out. Why do you think there are so many editorial layoffs happening right now? Because, you know, we've seen, especially um, in New York, we've seen quite a few of New York's local uh, news, news operators and news stations close. It's really due to the rise of the Internet, which happened quite a while ago and kept mm -hmm. mounting and became the prevalent way that people get their information. People look at their phones now. They don't even look at computers. And they get little, you know, ADD-friendly kind of Facebook bites or Twitter bites. Mm -hmm. And I think people have gotten out of the habit, in many cases, uh, you know, of reading an actual article or even a column. My column was pretty uh, breezy reading. It wasn't that demanding. Mm -hmm. But it grew from a third of a page to a full page. And it's hard to get people to even read a full page nowadays. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Which obviously makes me wonder, you know, last question here. Um, though there's a lot of nostalgia around The Voice, I think, for people, especially um, people who remember really the heyday of the nostalgia and the times that you were right of The Voice and the times that you were writing in. Um, uh, but what is the future for those voices? Because I don't think those voices are done. Well, a lot of the writers through the years past but the ones of us that are still here are still vibrant. We're still working. Mm -hmm. I work for newnownext.com, which is a website 
Uh, it's an LGBT website that gives me the same freedom, and I romp around and really write fun stuff, interviews, items, and opinion pieces. So, no, we're not going away. We're just evolving with the times, and I yeah. do great stuff on Facebook. Unfortunately, Facebook doesn't pay me, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I put out some great posts, whether it be a political screed or just something lighthearted. And, uh, no, there is no squelching of the voices, only of the voice itself. And even the mm -hmm. voice itself might have new life because the owner, Pete Barbie, is trying to sell it. So sure. I'm not writing the obit for the voice as of yet. Well, then we won't either. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Coming up, our conversation with Rembert Brown. He's a young and formidable Brooklyn-based writer. To call him emerging would minimize what he's already accomplished. Being named one of the most influential people in Brooklyn culture, being on a host of must-read lists, interviewing a president, Obama, and he recently scored the cover story for Time magazine with an interview of Spike Lee upon the release of Lee's latest film, Black Klansman. And he's barely over 30. Kind of a dick move. He spoke with Spike about race, success, and conformity, and we're going to talk to him about that and more. Rembert Brown, welcome to 112BK. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. This is the best. <laughs> Good. S season two? Season two. I'm excited. The start of season two. I'm very, very excited about that. Um, I just want to jump in yeah, and let's start go. asking let's go. you stuff because I love your brain. So it was so important for Agent Orange, as Spike Lee refers yes. to him, um, exclusively. to be <laughs> exclusively <laughs> to be on the cover of Time that he had a phony one made up and put on the wall. Now you are legitimately on the cover of Time magazine, or your words and your work yeah. are. Um, how do you feel about that? I have a lot of feelings. Mo like they're all good, but they're mm -hmm. all kind of like they they occupy different parts of my uh, my brain. Like there's the there's the initial thing, which is like my mom's happy, mm -hmm. so I'm happy. Like that's <laughs> just how things go. Like my mom, mm -hmm. <clears throat> my mom doesn't have to print out my internet articles to ch tell people that her son <laughs> has a job. Like she can be like, just go to CVS. Right, um, it's right there. Yeah, my mom told me a funny story uh, because the the cover before the Spike Lee cover, who went to Morehouse, mm -hmm. was Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor of Georgia. And she went to Spelman. She went to Spelman, and someone came up to my mom and was like, wow, like Morehouse and Spelman are having a big couple weeks. And my mom was like, Rimber didn't go to Morehouse. They were like, <laughs> no. Like, you know someone else was on the cover, right? <laughs> and so, no idea. Uh, my mom was like, oh, yeah. I thought oh, it was I just guess. him yeah. on him. Um, but no, it's cool. Like, it's, uh, it's also kind of interesting because mm -hmm. uh, it's like a reminder of the, the, the tough world of continuing to exist in print media. Oh, yeah. I had a hard time finding Time magazines. In New York City. Oh, yeah. It took me a minute when I did um, the cover, uh, Janelle Monet of Allure. Uh -huh. It took me a minute to find yeah. those. And I, so, like, I found them in New York, and every day my mom is like, they're not in Atlanta yet. Mm -hmm. They're not in Atlanta yet. Because there's just, like, it just takes time, and not every place has them. Like, living in Bushwick, I right. every Sunday I'm, like, reminding myself that when I just walk out and go to the bodega, there's not going to be a New York Times there mm -hmm. necessarily. Like yep. it's So, yeah, that was kind of like a, like, you know, yes, it's online, but you want to hold as many physical copies yes. as you can in this week window. Yes. That you have before <laughs> they make another one. Right. And I was just like, oh, man, like, I got to actually hunt these things down. Uh, you did. But it was still the best. It was still so cool. I bet it felt amazing. Like, it, I would think also um, the content, my goodness, that interview was yeah. fantastic. One of the things that I noticed about the interview that I really loved um, was that you sort of turned Martha's Vineyard into a character, yeah. like a silent witness to this conversation. Yeah. And then when the interjection finally came, it blossomed into like this whole other part of the story. Like when, when you talked about um, the interjection, somebody asking Spike Lee about sports, mm -hmm. that moment for me was like, I don't think I'd ever seen it written so clearly how those interjections happen yeah. and what they really mean when they happen. Well, it was just like, well, for, for starters, like I, like Martha's Vineyard has this like very historic black uh, history to it. Like, and a lot of it is kind of elite and, you know, mm -hmm. middle, upper class. I've, my whole life I've been wanting to go to Martha's Vineyard yeah. just to like see it. And right. Just, like, so 
like within one in one week I found out I was finally going to Martha's Vineyard and I was finally meeting Spike Lee. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is <laughs> this is a lot to handle. But it was I mean, those interjections were so interesting and I couldn't have it felt like I planted those men there mm-hmm. because it was so natural because right. I was And these were white men. Yeah, Just these were white clear men. For the list. <laughs> but these were white men, but it was also like Spike was in his full like I'm Spike Lee mm-hmm. mode where we didn't go to his house. We didn't go to like a quiet. There were lots of places we probably could have ducked in. We went to a very public park bench. Right. <laughs> next to where people were docking their boats. Right. And so like he wanted it was clear he wanted like his energy to you know yes. reverberate through the island or whoever was walking by. Mm-hmm. But then there was that other like people even if you don't know anything about film, even if you don't know, like, Spike Lee is one of, like, the more recognizable Americans. Absolutely. Even if you have not engaged with any of his, like, it's like it's like Snoop. Like, everyone yes. knows who Snoop like, like old, <laughs> yes. old, like, 90-year-old people know who Snoop Dogg is. They like, do. Everyone knows who Spike Lee is, and for a segment of the population, Spike Lee is mainstream because of his, like, long history being courtside at Knicks games mm-hmm. and being a very loud uh new york yankees fan right. and all that so it was it was just so interesting to like be having this very intense conversation about race in america and then still have people almost assume we were waiting to talk about sports with them oh yeah even if they kind of heard it's like it's like they might have heard, but they weren't really listening to what it's we were like, talking oh, better about. Better jump in and change the subject yeah. before this goes too. Wow, far. Like, like Spike Lee's here. He clearly wants to talk to me, right, about the Knicks. And it's like, wow, like, of course he's not trying to talk about that right now. But right, but you know, you know this is how it goes. And let's talk about this. Like you've made it in a certain way. You're a success. Like you have a name. You have a byline, and it is very recognized. Good SEO, thank you, Mom. Now, that's, thank <laughs> it's you. great thank SEO. You. It's, it's coming People back to me. People know River Brown. <laughs> But, you know, you arrive in the same territory, I think, as um, that spike is talking about, or that he's sort of, you're in a place where that warning um, makes sense. And I think it makes sense to me, too, where he says, for decades now, Spike Lee has been characterized as indignant, a coded way of saying, why rich men, (laughs) why rich men, are you still so angry? Yeah. Um, It's a common trap. Mainstream society can make successful black people prioritize smiling more and complaining less. Now... Time couldn't be more establishment, you know, in a certain yeah. way. So how do you avoid the pitfalls he's talking about when he talks about, you know, what I think quite a few black people are experiencing publicly, which is a public class transition and you knowing what you know because you haven't always been here? Yeah, I mean, I and this has happened a couple of times, like in writing profiles, like I'm. I'm writing about my my own anxieties while dealing with someone else talking about their anxieties. Like mm-hmm. when I wrote about Ka- I wrote about Kaepernick last year, and it was a similar exercise where right. I'm 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 using this public figure to, as like almost um, as a way to steer my own ship right. in a way. And like mm-hmm. you have Spike, who is a generation above me. I'm closer to his kids' age. Um, than I am to him, right? But when I'm thinking about Spike, oh, Spike is loud and brash, and I think one of the reasons he's that way is because he doesn't want to get diluted, and he doesn't like. I know I'm 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 realizing that's true about Spike, but I'm also like, okay, remember, like, you know, the deeper you get into these worlds, like, mm-hmm. you have to remind yourself, like, you also don't want to get diluted. Like, in what right. ways are you? going to keep people on their toes and what ways are you going to continue to do things so you aren't seen as oh he's like safe or he is like gotten so complacent that he doesn't um you know he doesn't remember where he came from and all this stuff and i think the i feel i feel really lucky Mm -hmm. um to have had i think a very gradual rise Mm -hmm. i started writing for public consumption when I was like 23 or 24 mm-hmm. like now I'm 31 it's like I felt I felt a little I felt ready for like uh, a, like a big swing like this right 
I don't th- I'm glad it didn't happen four years ago, you know? Yep. And I think it's it's hard to it's hard to, you know, deliberately pace your own career because mm-hmm. you want everything. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes <laughs> like sometimes like I have felt myself being like, you know what, I don't want to do that on camera thing right now. Yes. Because I don't know if I want everyone to know what what I look like when I walk down the street right. yet, you know? <laughs> right. It's like it's like a weird like trial and error uh thing with like in this world we live in well one of the things that spike brings up and that you explain succinctly i didn't realize that it was something that people didn't know the concept of was the okie doke oh, <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah when he said okie doke i was like i know, I know <laughs> yeah, what you're talking about right but i i'm guessing if i had put like i if i had put something like the okie doke in an essay any editor i had would have come back and said okay you have to explain what the okie doke is yeah so from my explanation of the okie doke Falling for the okie doke is like basically feeling like you've gotten to a place where you are safe and you are not safe. You are like more in danger. You are actually <laughs> you are more, more in danger yeah. and you have fallen for it. You've sort of been like, you know, coddled and you've been brought in yeah. as like this coddled thing and told this is, you know, who you are and this is why you are better than yeah. everyone else yeah, who and, is and not we're gonna, here. And we're going to use your existence here yes. to literally like mess up stuff for everyone else. Like yes. it's like, oh, you see that like like that floor over there? Like walk over it. It's it's like, yo, it's actually leaves. Yeah. There's a hole under <laughs> it. There's like, a leaf. It's I like, know a trap with it. It's one. leaves, you know? So and how do you keep from falling for the okie doke? I remember I remember going off to college uh and like leaving Atlanta and going to Dartmouth, like middle of nowhere. My mom was like, I'm very proud of you, blah blah blah. Like mm-hmm. One, th- I, sh- I thought like the spiel was about to be about like how to act <clears throat> and everything. Right. She was like, never stop coming home. Mm-hmm. She was like, once you stop like coming home, you start like basically a snowball of like forgetting like wh- who you are and mm-hmm. what you believe in and what you keep like closest to you and who you keep close. Like I feel like people who get caught up in the okay do- genuinely think that right. they are smarter and more special mm-hmm. than everyone else around them. And for me, it's always like, yo, like I have the hot hand right now. Mm-hmm. I have a platform. I, I think of having a platform as having a responsibility yes. to do do things that, like, I, I feel like I'm speaking on behalf mm-hmm. of, you know, my peers who might not have this platform, which is right. why I get excited to get some of these opportunities because I'm like, I know not every friend of mine is going to get to talk to Spike Lee, right? talk to Barack Obama, right. write about Colin Kaepernick. So I'm not just like, what do I want to ask these people? It's like, what are the things that we all want I love that. to address to these people? Because th- I mean, th- that's the point. The point is yeah. to get them to talk like... Not, not talk at us, but like, you know, talk with us. Ram, I love this. Okay. First of all, I love that. Yeah. But I want to talk a little bit about the Colin Kaepernick. Um, not just what you've written about Colin Kaepernick, which was as heartfelt as it was illuminating, I think. But also I want to talk about these recent developments with Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Colin Kaepernick being named, you know, one of the faces of the... Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> Nike. Yes. <laughs> Represent the Nike campaign. Thirty years, just do it. Yeah. Colin Kaepernick is the face. People cutting up their socks and burning their shoes. Raggedy um, socks. Ra- <laughs> just loose, <laughs> high yeah. ankle. Ugh, and it's just like right. Me out. And you look at it and you're like, whatever. That sock was loose anyway. Yeah, like I can see it fall. Anyway. You, know, you know those like those like zigzag arcs and crafts yeah. scissors. I was like, what? It really Third did. grade classroom. Did you rob? It did look like somebody gnawed on it. It It didn't really look like it had been cut. But these things are happening, and you've written about Cap, and you've you've been writing about this and actually being part of this discussion of Cap's protest um, that has expanded since it started with Cap. You've written about this so much, and you've talked about it so much. When you see this happening with Nike, like, how are you feeling about that? What are you thinking about that? Because, you know, corporation, but also revolution. Do those things go together? You know, I mean, the thing I... I feel like one thing I appreciate about living in New York, for example, Mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, starting off in journalism, like, and only thinking about that, but, you know, beginning to, like, expand what I do, just, like, 
like at this point in my life i'm just like i'm a writer lots of people need words so i'm just like like learn about all these industries like i i've 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 gained a lot of perspective and knowledge from just like learning about other companies and blah 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 like i know i think there's like the urge to think about nike as a like a corporation without humans that actually care about revolution right. you know i there are people that work in for brands for example that aren't that different from you or i they just went in that direction yes but they want to make a difference in the world that they landed in not i'm glad not everyone is a is a is a hot take generator online <laughs> you know professionally like i'm glad i'm i'm glad that i feel like we are in a generation where there's like lots of space for people who care about social issues yeah. to pop up. Are there people at Nike who I I know well who mm-hmm. like who care about this stuff? Like it took some human beings to make this happen. Mm-hmm. Like I spent eight months trying to talk to Cap. Like it, it right. took some like human some 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 human ingenuity to convince team Kaepernick that this is a good idea it took some actual people who care about revolution who decided to be yes. work for this company to make that happen and yes. and companies that don't because the flip side is companies that don't make these statements right. it's either no one like that or you have that sad example where it's just like there's one person who just like cares and like they don't get listened to like there's there has to be some power in numbers in a place like Nike to make that happen. Um, I have one more question for you. Okay. One of the interviews that you did that I love is when um, you got to ask Barack Obama one question. Yes. And the question that you asked him was essentially about being muzzled on the topic of race. Um, A lot of people feel like post-presidency, he's no longer muzzled. Mm -hmm. So if you had a question to ask him now, what would it be? It's a really good question. Not only is he not muzzled, but he's out here. Uh, he is out here. <laughs> getting his tans. <laughs> just like. Letting the waves yeah, in. I, like, I feel like I hate when people are like, like, Barack, like, where are you? I'm like, are you serious? Like, right. yes, like, like, Rome is burning. But, like, let this right. man, like, yes. it, like, we put him through a hundred hells, you we know. Um, if I had to ask him a question, it would, it would. I don't I don't really I, I'm not really interested in like if you could have could have should have stuff. I'm just like I'm really interested in two things. One, um like what medium does he find does he feel like he's gonna make his best impact going forward? Like because he's gotten involved like, Yeah, so like a book, there's yeah, like he's got a Netflix, Netflix deal. Like does he does he think like like does he think it's gonna be like Oh, like I go, I go speak across the country, mm-hmm. and like because there is a world in which like when you are in front of Barack Obama, if Barack, mm-hmm. when Barack Obama is speaking at you, it was is going to change your life. Right. So like <laughs> if Barack Obama can find a way to like get in front of every like thirteen year old mm-hmm. like in the next three or four years, like we're gonna be like we're we're gonna be good. Right. You know. <laughs> right. But like also there's like the macro things mm-hmm. like like if he can find you know. Like like this Netflix thing, I don't know what is going to happen, but mm-hmm. like I just want to know wh- where he thinks his impact is going to be best felt, and mm-hmm. like and and why. Um, the other thing I would like to ask him is just like, so what does it look like for you to take the back seat and let Michelle just like go wild, you know? Yeah. Because like <laughs> because you know, and like I, I know his answer is like yes, I want to do that because right. he's like. That's that's how he is, mm-hmm. but like I am I am so interested in what she does oh, yeah. because like there's so many, <clears throat> and I hope none of them involve politics. Oh, I like think they will. you know, like I just <clears throat> they they literally can't, like it, there's 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 pros and cons of literally being able to do anything. Oh yeah, they can literally do anything. Mm-hmm. They could be like, we own NBC now. Yeah, they could. They literally <laughs> and they, well could. they'd be like, okay, like yeah, what? Well. What's what's the lineup gonna be? <laughs> right. You know. Uh, but I just, you know, I'm as a as a child of the like like a 
college, high school, college age, like child of the Obamas. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all, all, all of my, most of my like motivational things that happened in my life stemmed from them. Oh yeah. So 2008 I'm, was a strong year. For that me. was, I was out here, megaphone, mm -hmm. bullhorn, you know, <laughs> like that's like, their DNA is like in a ton of us, you know, it and is. like I think in our lives would have probably gone in a different direction um, had they not just existed, but like somehow like implanted something in us that uh, you, oh, you can go do anything. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm still out here for the Obamas. Me too. I, I feel the same way. I'm and I'm always open to hear more of what they both have to say. Oh, yeah. And I'm always open to hearing more of what you have to say. Remember, uh, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you for having me. This has been fantastic. This is great. Truly. I love the studio. <laughs> I love the studio everything. Loves you. I, lo I love it. Come thank back you. Sometime. I will. All right. Now, these things brought to you by Brooklyner. New York City public schools are back in session September 5th and just in time. Governor Cuomo, Mayor de Blasio, and the New York City Council have worked together to get speed cameras switched back on for the students' first day back. The cameras were turned off on July 25th after the New York State Senate failed to renew and expand a bill that mandated them before the end of the legislative session on June 21st. Also in time for school, the Department of Education released a report detailing how much every public school in the city spends per child. You can check it out and compare your child's school with other schools. And try not to get too pissed off, though. If it was my baby, mm. The New York Post reports that according to a new analysis over the past five years, the city has paid $384 million to settle cases of police misconduct. More than half of that money has involved lawsuits that did not go to trial, and a sizable portion went towards settling the sort of nuisance suits that Mayor de Blasio promised to crack down on in 2015. On Thursday, neighbors and members of the Brooklyn Bears Rockwell Garden protested the massive 80 Flatbush project, which they say will significantly block the sunlight from their community garden as well as surrounding areas. Last week, council member Stephen Levin weighed in on the towering project, saying the skyscraper would have to shrink by a third before it could gain his key vote on the project. For more, informa for more information on these and other Brooklyn items, go check out Brooklyner at BKLYNER.com. Thanks for joining us. That's the show for today. Hope you can join us tomorrow when we'll be speaking with a state Senate candidate hoping to replace one of the most controversial politicians in Albany. Bye-bye. <laughs>